This is the Mac Studio, which basically just looks like a grown up and taller Mac Mini. I've had it pretty much since launch and I've had a chance to really use it and incorporate it into my day to day life. And today we're gonna talk about it and I'll give you my thoughts on it. Is it worth the price tag? Do you even need one? Well, let's find out with a little review. The Mac Studio sits between the Mac Mini and the Mac Pro in terms of price and size. However, it has more in common with the Mac Mini than it does the Mac Pro. It's a giant block of aluminum, which feels similar to pretty much any other Mac. Usually, I show a bunch of different product shots in review, but since this is just a giant aluminum cube, there's only so much that I can do. There's two USB 4 ports up front, an SD card slot, and a white LED light when it's on. If you get the M1 Ultra version of this machine, the USB 4 ports up front are actually Thunderbolt 4 ports. And on the back, you get even more ports. You get a power port, HDMI 2.0, four Thunderbolt 4 ports, two regular USB ports, 10 gig ethernet, and a headphone jack. In terms of sheer IO, this thing is fantastic. There's so many ways to plug in all your different devices into it. And because it has ports in the front, you can keep all your often used devices there and your monitors and permanently attached peripherals like mic and webcams in the back. If you flip the Mac Studio over and onto the bottom, you can see the Mac Studio etching right in the middle. Maybe the giant circle is supposed to represent Apple's giant circular campus, but honestly, that might just be my imagination. But around that giant circle is actually airflow vents. You can technically open the Mac Studio up by removing the bottom black rubber ring, but you can't really put that piece back on. So in this situation, I won't be ripping mine off. But even though you can remove the bottom piece, there's no way to officially upgrade the internals of the Mac Studio, which is a shame since the Mac Pro is actually modular, meaning you can replace many of the internal parts of that machine. It would have been great if the Mac Studio was as well. I get why the Mac Mini isn't modular. It's a consumer level device. Just like how I don't expect everyone's grandparents to know how to shove a graphics card or upgrade storage in a Dell Inspiron from 2010. But on the Mac Studio, I'm sure it would be appreciated by the user base of this machine for some sort of upgradability, even if it's just something like storage. The only real expandable part of this machine it's the sheer number of ports that allow you to add all the different devices you want to connect to the Mac Studio. If you consider that expandability, then I guess this is the most expandable M1 Mac by that definition. All right, now let's talk about user experience. The Mac Studio is a device that sits between the Mac Mini and the Mac Pro. If the Mac Mini is for the average person and the Mac Pro is for professionals, then the studio name would imply either a creative professional or someone in between a pro and a consumer, a prosumer. And as someone who makes content on YouTube, I like to think that I fit pretty much right smack in the middle of that prosumer demographic. I do 4K ProRes video editing off of a NAS through a 10 gigabit connection. I do some light photo editing with awkward photos of my face for YouTube thumbnails. I write video scripts. I read sketchy sponsorship emails from companies who can't even bother to spell my channel name right. Basically, I use the Mac Studio as a centralized hub that controls my entire YouTube operation. And it does everything I need, it does it well, and it does it fast. And really, that's all you need out of a machine. The Mac Studio is for the most part whisper quiet. While doing most tasks, I did not hear the machine. Under some stress tests, the studio does get louder, but not significantly louder. The Q sticks may be completely different on the M1 Ultra variant, since that one is a beefier chip. In places with a low noise floor, you will hear the M1 Max, Mac Studios fans. While the Mac Studio is a standalone computer, it does have a speaker. And well, compared to the speakers found in Apple's other computers, this one is not very good. Which is a shame because there is a space within the body for some better speakers. I know Apple's intention was not for the person buying this machine to use the internal speaker, but rather connect nicer external speakers or use headphones. But I wasn't hoping for amazing speakers, just okay ones. But the speakers on this thing aren't it and I'd recommend using pretty much anything else. The ports on the Mac Studio enable you to better multitask on the machine. Something I didn't actively think about before owning this machine, all these extra ports help me better multitask. Sometimes I use the M1 iMac to edit my YouTube videos and literally every port on that thing gets filled up with external drives, SD cards, a multi-gig ethernet adapter, and charging cables for the wireless mice and keyboards. And then I have to start using USB-C hubs that might or might not want to cooperate on that particular day. That isn't an issue that just affects video editors, but something that could affect many different work environments where you need a bunch of things plugged in at a time. On the Mac Studio, there's already plenty of ports. 
letting me pretty much keep all my devices plugged in without having to constantly pull things in and out and swapping different devices around. And because it has front IO, it makes it easier to quick swap versus plugging and unplugging from the back like the F1 Mac Mini. Just like every other Mac, when you first turn on this machine, it gives you the Apple sound. But on that initial first boot up, something really interesting happened to me. I couldn't connect my Bluetooth Logitech mouse and Bluetooth keyboard to the Mac Studio. I had to pull out a USB mouse and an Apple Magic Keyboard that I haven't used in years to even set up the machine. And every time it boots, it refuses to acknowledge my Logitech keyboard and only acknowledges the Apple branded one. It's really weird, and I suggest having USB peripherals or wireless ones with dongles just in case that ends up happening to you too. I'm not sure if this is an Apple or Logitech specific issue, but just something to keep in mind, and it gets really annoying when I need to restart or a power outage happens and I have to repeat the process, and now I have to keep an extra mouse and keyboard around just in case this happens. Okay, so now let's talk about performance. Since this is the base model Mac Studio with the M1 Max processor, the processor itself performs similar to what you find in the cheapest M1 Max MacBook Pro. So I'll just show some quick comparisons between the machine and some other M1 machines that I have around, the M1 iMac and the M1 Pro MacBook Pro. We'll test four different use cases with four different benchmarks. Shadow the Tomb Raider for gaming, Geekbench 5 for general computing, an actual Jimmy Tries World video export from Final Cut Pro for video editing, and Affinity Photos benchmark for photo editing because that's the photo editing tool that I personally use. Full disclaimer, this isn't a comprehensive test. There are definitely videos dedicated to just testing performance, so you should probably check those out. But these tests revolves around the applications that I'm most familiar with, and that I have access to. On Geekbench, the Mac Studio has similar single core performance as its siblings, since they use basically the same cores. The multi-core scores scale accordingly with the M1 Max on top. In the Affinity benchmark, the M1 Max was more than double the performance of the M1 thanks to all the extra graphics scores. For Shadow the Tomb Raider at 1080p medium settings, the performance of the chips scale almost linearly based on how many graphics scores are on the machine, with the M1 Max hitting an average of 87 FPS. This is through a Rosetta 2 translation layer, but these Macs are are still not gaming machines. But with the M1 Pro or M1 Max, you might be able to scratch your gaming itch a little bit. Not that I'd recommend it though. Now, this benchmark is what really shocked me. The M1 Max in a 4K video export of a five minute segment of one of my own YouTube timelines took only two minutes and 54 seconds. This is with background rendering turned off. The M1 Max just absolutely flies here. So what's the main takeaway you can get from these benchmarks? The M1 Max found within the Mac Studio and higher end MacBook Pros are fast, really fast, but we knew this. Pretty much anything you throw at it, it'll do well. So then if this machine shares the same processor and performs similarly to a similarly spec MacBook Pro, then what do we think about this machine? At $2,000, the Mac Studio is a pricey computer. And at $4,000 for the M1 Ultra variant, this machine is out of most people's price range for a computer. I often try to review a product from the point of view of the average person, looking up random reviews on YouTube or Reddit, and trying to figure out the best item for them to buy for themselves or their family. When I look at this Mac from that specific point of view, I think this machine is completely overkill for most people. Seriously, let's look at some use cases. If you're looking for a family computer that you use to print things or do schoolwork on, pay your bills or check your emails, there's the M1 Mac Mini which is really good for its price and still has a ton of ports. Or you can go with the M1 iMac. It has fewer ports, but at least everything is all put together and it's easy for your kids to understand. One button turns the whole thing on and the different colors can pretty much match whatever room you're putting it in. If you need a machine to be used in an office setting for productivity, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint, stuff like that, still, M1 Mac Mini or M1 iMac, those machines would handle that sort of stuff perfectly fine. But then when you think of this machine from a prosumer perspective, that's where you really start to see its value. It's currently the cheapest way to get the performance of an M1 Max and currently the only way to get an M1 Ultra in the Apple Mac lineup. It's also the most expandable Mac since Apple's transition to ARM, thanks to how many ports it has. This really is a machine for the power users, prosumers, Mac enthusiasts, and people who really need to use their Macs and get as much performance as possible because it means things get done faster. So if you're looking for a workhorse of a machine, a do everything machine, I'd look at the studio. Otherwise, I'd go with one of the M1 alternatives or if Apple ever releases an M1 Pro or M2 Pro Mac Mini, 
that would be a fantastic middle ground between the two. Either way, true to its name, the Mac Studio is the headless Mac content creators, power users, and enthusiasts were waiting for. All it really needs now is to be upgradable like the Mac Pro. Now, now that would be nice. Maybe next year. A man can dream, even if that will never come. Anyway, what do you personally think? Are you thinking about getting the Mac Studio? What do you plan to use it for? Or did this video push you away from the Mac Studio? What other computers are you considering? Leave all that in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. And well, don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you all next time. Bye.